we surely are beginning our discussion right now. In beginning our discussion, once again, we look at what we call the two-way tables, then diagrams, three diagrams, sequences, and series. Right, so we look at um, probability. Um, that is, these are the tools we use to study probability. The answer is very important that we understand the tools very well to get started. Right, as part of what you need to learn, these two-way tables are very important for us to understand them. In a survey of 1,530 sky divers were asked if they had broken a limb, the results of the survey were as follows. So you have the results of the survey, they were they as shown. Right, so you have the male, you have the female, you have the totals, you have the broken limb, not broken limb, the totals. Male, broken limb, not broken limb, the total is 782. Female, broken limb, not broken limb, total is D. The broken limb total is 913. Not broken limb total is 617. Total is 1530. Calculate the values of A, B, C, and D. Right, so we look at this uh, very carefully and we ensure that we can be able to do the calculations here. And to comfortably be able to answer this question. What is the numerical value of A? Right, looking at this question, we're able to see clearly that uh, the value of A is that which when you add to 463, 463 plus A must give us 913. And so A can only be 450 because of 450 plus um, that is plus uh, 463 is 913. And then uh, that means that we shall be able to answer this question um, and realize the full that our A is equal to 450. I've made enough space for us to answer the question. So um, we've already seen that A here is 450. And therefore, here we have that our A is 450. B, okay. B is that when you add 463, you get 782. What must B be? 319. Because 463 plus 319 gives us 782. So what is our B here? Our B is 319. What is our C? Right, our C is that when we add to the B, B plus C must be 617. So uh, clearly here, our C must be 298 because 298 plus 319 is um, that one there. Right, so we're good. We're so good. Right, I think that we need to invite Bupilo as well and uh, Bupilo be with us here because we're doing probability. Probability is there both ways. Um, So, I want to invite Bupilo. To be with us. I want to invite Bupilo to be with us. Yes, can you join our discussion now on la on on Zoom? Yeah, yeah, because I'm having Tenulo, but yeah, I wanted yeah. you to join Isn't us as well. Mate? We're discussing common things. Comments. Wait, oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay, that's fine. I'll get back to you when we're done, then so that you can fix it. Okay. Okay, sharp pillow. All right. Pilo is saying it doesn't download this Zoom thing, is not working on her phone. I, don't, I will, will check that. Okay, I wanted her to be part of us. Okay. Now, 
D must be the number which when added to 782 gives us 1530. And D is actually 748. So 782 plus 748 gives us 1530. Well, we were saying C is 298, but we're also saying D is 748. Okay. So this sort of gives us the answers we need. The next thing we're going to do. Um, so what was the question? Calculate the values of A, B, C, and D. We found A, we found B, C, and D. We found those. So we're done with 5.1. Think about whether you understand or not and ask questions. Right, so we move on to the next question. We move on to the next question. And the next question is about more learning and more understanding so that we can be in a position to understand the things very, very well. Because uh, we need to make sure that people understand the work so that they can become very good learners. I'm spending time revealing, showing this screen because we've done a series of calculations to me, it is very important that you understand every single bit of thing on the screen. Next question. Okay, we have found already the numerical values of A, B, C, and D, and we can even quote them here. We need to now calculate the probability of choosing at random in the survey a female skydiver who has not broken a limb. Uh, so we analyze that one together. Okay, let's first start with the A. So A here is a number which you can add to 463 to get 913. And we saw that A is 450 because 450 plus 463 is 913. B is 319, um, right, 319. And we found C to be 298 from the previous question. I'm just writing the those down and filling the table up right so this one is a four this d is seven four eight now with that said here we are continuing to say calculate the probability of choosing at random in the survey a female skydiver who has not broken a limb so we're looking at a female skydiver who has not broken a limb so we are here right so the probability the probability P of a female um, of a female skydiver who has not broken. a limb, a female skydiver who has not broken a limb. Right, so we good, who has not broken a limb. So what is the probability here? The probability would be female, not broken the limb, 298. The total, total of everything, the total of everything. What is the total of everything? 1530. Yeah, 1530, yeah. Um... If you simplify this here, 
This simplified fraction is 149 divided by 765. Okay. So that becomes the answer there. Comes the answer. Next. So we found a probability here. The next probability is yours. I'm giving it to you to try with me. The same question still persists. And we found I was uh, just uh, putting the table here to make sure we can fill it in because the table is uh, the tool we use to organize the information. A is 450, B is 319, B is 298, D is uh, 748. So in a survey, 1530 Skydive, as we asked if they'd broken a limb, the results of the survey were as follows. Broken a limb, 450 plus 463 is, is 913. 319, 298, 617. 782, 748, you add, you get 1530. 1,530 uh, there. Okay. Is being a female skydiver and having broken a limb independent use calculation? So we're looking at independent events. Right. So the use uh, calculations corrected to decimal places to motivate your answer. So now we are looking at a female skydiver um, broken a limb. Right, so if we let um, FS, right, if we let FS become the following, we let FS to actually mean female skydiver. Right. Then we have broken a limb. Broken. A limb. Okay, are they independent? Use calculations correct to decimal places to motivate your answer. The probability. A female skydiver, right, female skydiver who has not broken a limb. Is what? Okay. Right, I'm having Ayanda here <laughs> joining us as well because Ayanda had to join us earlier, but it's okay. <laughs> right. So we continue. We continue. <laughs> We continue right so we continue right now and we are saying at this point a female skydiver who has not broken the limb is going to become what Right, so you look at the female skydiver. Who has broken a limb? That's what I want to consider first. Female skydiver who has broken a limb. Right, so. Right, it's being a female skydiver having broken a limb. Um, are these actually independent um, events? So let me look at, let me write it as follows and say, 
Vamos lá, Tito falou sem sei. We are looking at a female skydiver and broken a limb. Right. So that is going to become female skydiver and broken a limb. Female skydiver having broken a limb. So you have to look at the fact that female broken a limb. How many? 450. So you put 450 here. You divide everything by total of everything. 1530. Simplifying this fraction here is going to become 5 out of 17. Okay. And 5 out of 17 is the same as approximately what? Using calculator is 0, 0,29. 294. 1, 1. 76471. Let's look now at the probability. Right, as I said, this discussion is being recorded in case your network, the network is not so good. The probability of a female skydiver. Times uh, the probability of broken limb. What does independent events mean? So by independent, by independent events in mathematics and statistics, we mean that the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. So this can also be written as the probability of, come here, the probability of A and B, okay? If we, we can also write the end like I have just done now. I, we can just write the end as, we, uh, as I've just done right now. So if you write the end as, you have, as I've just done now, you have that. Okay. Um, the probability of A and B is the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So obviously this here is uh, what we call independent events. This formula is true for independent events. The probability of A and B. So you can use the intersection symbol and the intersection symbol is the same as the end symbol. A conjunction in English. Right, so what is all this here? The probability of a female skydiver. What is the probability of uh, picking a female skydiver? The probability of actually picking a female skydiver is what? Right, the probability of picking a female skydiver, either broken a limb or not broken a limb, is 748. Divided by the probability by the total summation, divided by the total summation of every single bit of thing. Okay, what is the probability of broken a limb? Broken a limb probability, or rather, first, how many um, they, are, um, they have their limbs broken? Broken a limb. How many have their limbs broken all together? Right, so broken limbs, broken limbs, the total of the broken limbs is you have the male and the female. Some of the males 
Because when they do skydiving, when you skydive, sometimes when you you actually break your, your limb, you actually possibly can have your limb broken. Okay? Um, I've seen the answer. Right, I have actually seen the answer in the chats. In, thank you for the attempt there. Yeah, you're right. You are on point. Anyway, you're on point. But broken a limb is going to be broken a limb. Total broken a limb is this one. Broken a limb is this one. 913, 913. Right. So we're good. Broken a limb is going to be 913. I write that one down. Divided by, so yeah, just to buy the screen a little bit here. These numbers are going to get mixed up. And then now, obviously, when you find the probability, divide by the total of everything. Use a calculator is 0, 0.29. Full stop. Okay, we have this system here. And we're asking the question. Are these events independent or not? They're going to ask you, are they independent or not? Okay, we're going to look at mutual exclusive events, complementary events, and whatnot. But those ones are too easy. But yeah, we, we will discuss mutual exclusive to say what does it mean. But independent is, involves a bit more calculation. So sometimes they like it. It's more popular to speak of independent events in the exams. Okay, so... Let me divide the screen a little bit here. Let me divide the screen a little bit to finish. I know that I'm writing too much, congesting everything here. So now we can see that if you look at the probability of a female skydiver and broken a limb is 0, 0.29, the probability of female skydiver times broken a limb is 0, 0.29 as well. So. Yes. Yes, uh, the probability of a female skydiver and broken a limb is the same as the probability of a female skydiver times the probability of broken a limb. Yes, independent. Yes, independent seems. Yes, independent seems uh, this is true because the probability of a female skydiver and broken a limb is 0, 0.29, but female skydiver and broken a limb is 0, 0.29. Look carefully. We can see that they are both 0, 0.29 and therefore they compare, they are just almost equal to each other. And in this, at this point, they rounded off to two decimal places, they are equal. And therefore we agree that the events themselves are independent. So we have to discuss what are independent events in statistics? What are independent events in probability? It is when we say the probability of A and the probability of B equals the probability of A times the probability of B. What are mutual exclusive events? I'm going to speak about mutual exclusive events. I'm going to speak about complementary events and other types of events. But first, let's look at the next question. As part of our study, they ask us to look at the vans, the Venn diagrams. Right, a survey is conducted among 174 students. The results are shown below. You have 37 study LS, life sciences, 60, 60 study physical sciences, 111, okay, triple one, study mathematics, 29, study life sciences and math, 50, study math and physical sciences, 13, Study physical sciences and life sciences. Okay, they're asking us to draw a Venn diagram to represent the information. Let's look at the specific question. 
I want us to answer question set 6.1, but I want us to learn how to draw the Venn diagram in the exam because if I ask you to draw a two-way table, the question I brought here had the two-way table already drawn, but I'm going to bring another question in our next meeting where you need to just draw the two-way table yourself. Let me see how well we can do that. So, um, that's the kinds of things we do. Okay, a survey is conducted amongst 174 students. The results are shown below. 37 study life sciences. This is exactly question six. Question six. But to draw the Venn diagram here, we need to draw big. From here to there. We, we go across like this. We go down, we run across like this. Right, so we analyze this together. So we understand that we have those who study life sciences, physical sciences, and math. And a combination of somebody doing like math and, and physical sciences, or they're doing life sciences and math, or Another student maybe can do like 45, do not study any of this. So 45 students do not do life sciences. They don't do math they or physical sciences. So there are students who study life sciences, math and physical sciences. They also don't do any of this because a student can decide to do accounting and not do life sciences. In the place of life sciences, they can do accounting, they can do economics, they can do business studies or something of that sort. So obviously we are, Trying to organize the information here. So let's look at these together. Now we say these students who do, for example, life sciences, let's call that L. And then there are those students who decide to do physical sciences. And there are those students who decide to do Mathematics. Okay, not everybody obviously does mathematics because some people want to do, um, some people want to do like math leads. So we need to respect their choice of math leads. But some students are like, okay, they want to do I know that these things are not perfect circles. Yeah, they should not be perfect circles anyway. I'm trying to make them a little bit oval, but yeah. <laughs> right, so let's look at these now. Let's start and fill in the information. To draw a Venn diagram, we need to fill in the information here and make sure that all is pretty very, very well. But maybe these are not so large enough. Um, please allow me to make them a bit larger. Let me see if I can make them a little bit larger, but oval. Right, they should not really be perfect circles, but yeah, a little bit oval. Let me give it a try once more. If this one here is gonna be just this way here. Little bit like an egg. In this, this one that's gonna like, Another little egg, and this one, another egg. Okay, so life sciences, physical sciences, and math. Okay, 37 life sciences, 60 study physical sciences. Yeah, yeah. triple one study mathematics. 29 study life sciences and math. 50 study mathematics and physical sciences. 13 study physical sciences and life sciences. 45 do not study any life sciences, mathematics or physical sciences. Ex students study life sciences, 
mathematics and physical sciences. Okay, X students study, this is the most important thing. So X students would study those, right? So let's look at X students. So X students will study um, life sciences, mathematics and physical sciences. So X are here where all these events intersect. Then now we have also, if you have X here, then you can come to this one. 13 students study. Now we look at the ones that are like here, mostly. 13 students study physical sciences and life sciences. Physical sciences and life sciences, there must be 13, but you already have X here. So which means that we shall have 13 minus X. Okay. Fifty. Study mathematics and physical sciences. Right. If you get the fact that fifty study mathematics and physical sciences, so you have mathematics and physical sciences. There must be um fifty of them. Mathematics. So you already have x here, which means it must be fifty minus x. Fifty minus x. Because now, when you add 50 minus x and, 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 and x, you get 50. So that you have 50 study mathematics and physical sciences. We're done with this. We're done with the 13. So you shall look at the 45. We're done with the x. 29, study life sciences and math. OK? Life sciences and math, there must be 29. So it means already have x here. These ones are. 29 minus x. Okay? Because when you add the 29 minus x and this one, they give you 29. Triple one, 111, study mathematics. So, those here in mathematics, they must give you 111. So first you can call this one small m so that you can say if they say study mathematics so yeah you look at the event for those who do mathematics so you want to say m plus 29 minus x to make it easier plus x plus 50 minus x plus m um, no, yeah. <laughs> okay, I obviously we add the M once. And therefore this here must be the same as what? It must be the same as the one so to mathematics. So in there are 111 of them. Right, and then you have X minus X, which is zero. The X cancel out. Want to solve for M. Want to know how many like do Math only. So now you're going to have 29 and 50. I'm going to have 29 and 50. Um, right. So right. So now you have 29 and 50, which means that you have um, 111 minus 50. Which would be what? Would you be like 61? Out of 61, you subtract 30 plus 1. Subtract 30, then 1 less. Right. If out of 111, you subtract 50, you'll get like a 61. And then you subtract 29, in a sense. So 60 minus 29, what is the result? 61 minus, so in other words, what we are saying is 111, you do that on your head, minus 29 minus 50. So that is gonna give you a 32, 
It's going to give 32. 111 minus 29 minus 50 is going to give you like 32. And then x minus x is 0. And then you're actually going to add an x like this. 32 plus x. So, yeah. That's how we get 32 plus x. Okay. So, we are done with this one of 111. We use the 100. So, we must use like all the numbers here. Six is start with physical sciences. So, physical sciences must be 60. So, it's the same thing like we come to this one. <laughs> there must be 60. Everything here. These plus these plus that plus that must be 60. So, which means that you're going to do this. We're going to do, call this P, like lowercase p, so that you're going to have 13 minus x plus x plus 50 minus x plus p. It must give you the total for science. This called science is 60. So like in the end, then we want to do, want to get what P is. How many of those, like if six do physical sciences, it's not that they only do physical sciences, okay? Um, but how many only do science, physics, physical sciences? So we subtract. So we're gonna have the 50 and the 13, right? And then the x, x minus x is zero. The x moved across is gonna be like plus x. Okay, if you have 50 and 50 plus um, 13, what does it give us? It gives us 63. 60 minus 63 is minus three. So this one is x minus three. Okay. All right, so we have this. Right, next. So we're done with um, 60 for physical sciences. But now let's come to life sciences because there, there are 37 of those who do life sciences. There are 37 of them. So if like 37 do life sciences, what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of this? 37 do life sciences. What is the meaning of these? We analyze it. So, in other words, 37 do life sciences. This, that, and that is life sciences. So, let's do the life sciences here. Right. So, we're going to do life sciences at the top here. Okay, now life sciences folks would be this plus this plus that. Okay, we call this small l. So which means that we're gonna have the small l for life sciences. For those who only, only do life sciences, but some do life sciences and math, life sciences and physics. So which means that you're gonna have 29 minus x. We add x. We add 13 minus x, and then, yeah, we add all these. And then when you add all these, the 29, the x, and the 13 minus x, the result must be life sciences total 37. So, We get the answer. Okay, x minus x is zero, so that this x here moved across is going to become there. There is 29 and 13. What is 29 plus 13? Okay, 20 plus 10 is actually 30. And so this is exactly like a 42. A 42, it's a, 
37 minus 42 will give us a 5 negative. X minus 5. X minus five. So we continue. We continue. Okay. We are not done yet. We did this, we did that one, this one. So it helps to tick so that you can like, okay, we need to deal with the 45 now. Okay, we dealt with the X. Yeah, 45 is the only one that's left. 45, do not study any life sciences, mathematics or physical sciences. They are 45. So we agree that they total of 45 learners who don't do any of those. They do other things. They do like cat. Um, they do like business studies. They do other things. They do consumer studies. So they do history. They don't then if they don't do history, they decide, okay, they want to do history and math leads, they don't want pure, pure math at all. Okay. Is the Venn diagram complete? Let's check. And the Venn diagram, as drawn here, must have a total of eight regions. So we need a total of eight regions. Are all the eight regions filled in? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, all the regions have been filled up. And therefore, the question was draw a Venn diagram to represent the information above. We have drawn the Venn diagram. We have uh, represented the information above. And so we get the full marks six there. Okay, next question. Next question. So that x equals 13, 1, 3. So that x equals 1, 3. So that x equals one three. What is x equals 13? So we would just uh, actually recall something about the Venn diagram we just drew. The Venn diagram we just drew was uh, something of this sort. I'm just gonna draw it quickly. So that you don't waste a lot of time on the Venn diagram. And uh, it was like this. It was sort of this way. And then it was sort of this way here. And uh, there were a couple of features of interest to us. There was uh, life sciences, uh, there was uh, physical sciences, uh, and there was uh, mathematics. Uh, this was x minus 5, and this was only x. This was uh, 13 minus x. This was um, 29 minus x. This was uh, 50 minus x. This was x uh, minus 3. This was uh, 32 plus x. This was uh, 45. And so we had this here, and so this is uh, all. So we need to show that uh, 13 is equal to, x is equal to 13. Let's show that x equals 13. To show that x equals 13, we proceed as follows. So we add everything together. Why to add everything together? We need to remember that it's a survey that is conducted among a total of 174 learners, meaning we're gonna add everything. So we're gonna start by the x minus five, we add, and then we add, uh, 13 minus x. Then we add x minus 3. x minus 3. And then we add 29 minus x. This one. And then we add 50 minus x. And then we add uh, 32 plus x. And then we add um, 36. We add just x. This one. And then we add 
45. If we add everything, it becomes 174. Okay. It becomes 174. So we continue. Now we proceed uh, because we need to solve this question. We need to now solve, and to solve this question, we find uh, the following. So if you add everything here, it becomes exactly x. Then we get 161. Add all these numbers. If it gives 161, I know you can do addition, and it's 174 on the right. So x now is going to become 174 minus 161, which is actually equal to 13. So this is the answer because they asked us to just show that x equals 13, and we have shown that. Okay. So note that. The answer, we have uh, answered this question. So um, take your time to analyze this question because we shall be moving to another question here uh, together. So. But to make sure that uh, everything is okay and we are most certainly on the same page together. So um, we're having this session here. There's another session that's going to start at 2 p.m. So um, you need to be ready to begin with us as well at uh, 2 p.m. So yeah, um, be ready there to begin with us at exactly 2 p.m. So that. You can learn the mathematics and prepare for the exams because the exams are here and they are here to, to catch you. The examiners are here to catch you. The, uh, they are here to challenge you. So you must be ready to understand the things. How do you understand the things? It's when you can do these questions on your own. So after you watch this video, you must actually look at the question without looking at the answer and make sure you can show that X equals 13. And that is what needs to happen. So um, if you can do that, then it's actually perfect stuff. It's very, very perfect stuff. So let's continue. Right, so there are some questions they're asking us to calculate the probability. So let us uh, deal with the probability. Now they are finding, they are saying, what is the probability? Okay, let's uh, analyze the probability. Right, if a student, okay, the rest of the information you already know. If a student was selected at random, calculate the probability that he studies the following, mathematics, physical sciences, but not life sciences. The student does not like life sciences and decides, I want to do only math and physics, but not life sciences. That is their choice. But now, what is the probability, calculate the probability that he studies the following there. Okay, so yeah, just two marks. I'm gonna just uh, bring to the surface again our Venn, our Venn diagram. I'm gonna be really quick, quick in drawing it. Make sure we don't waste a lot of time. We already know what's happening with the Venn. Right, so yeah, the Venn diagram, and uh, we remember there were events here, an event like this, another event like this, another event like this. Life sciences, physical sciences, the mathematics. Now, this was exactly x without five, x minus five, 13 minus x. This was x minus three. This was 50 minus x. This was only just x. This was 29 without x. This was 32 plus x. This was 45, All right? You ask if a student was selected at random, calculate the probability that he studies the following mathematics and physical sciences, but not life sciences. Let us do with that probability there. So that's pretty straightforward. 
So here we're going to do the probability. I can just do it here. So if we do the probability, for example, that a student does mathematics and physical sciences, not life sciences. So they do M and L, mathematics and physical sciences, but not life sciences. So now tell me, what is the probability here? All right, we already know that X equals 13. So if X equals 13, we are looking at mathematics and physical sciences, but not life sciences. Mathematics and physical sciences, we are here, but life sciences is out. So we're gonna be considering only the 50 minus X because it's mathematics, physical sciences, but life sciences from here, it's out. So yeah, 50 minus X is what we focus on. And then we divide by the total. What is the total? The total is 174. Okay, what is X? We already know that in the problem, X is 1313, and we divide everything by 174. What is 50 minus 13? It's 37 over 174, which is actually equal to zero. 21. So that is the answer approximately, obviously. Meaning that we have that at this point here, um, we can do the calculations uh, with ease and realize that these guys here are approximately equal to each other. So the probability that a student if a student was selected at random, the student selected at random, um, we need to, we have to calculate the probability that he studies uh, the following, mathematics and physical sciences, but not life sciences. Okay, so yeah. We have exactly that part. Right, so we have answered 6.3.1 and we got the two marks there. Let's look at 6.3.2. Let's look at more probability calculations. If a student was selected at random, so they select a student at random, they just go to the group of the students and they like, let's go to the class. If they get to the class, they just choose a st one student at random. Either it's a boy or a girl, it doesn't matter, but they just choose one. If a, a student is selected at random, calculate the probability that he studies the following. Only one of mathematics or physical sciences or life sciences is doing only one of the three, only one of mathematics of, phys of physical sciences or life sciences. So if you take math, physical sciences and life sciences is doing one of these. What is the probability? Okay, I'm just gonna um, have it here. So yeah, forgive me, please. The Venn diagram is part of what we need to learn. Okay, I need to speak about complementary events and the complement of an event as the region outside the event space. Um, right, so would remember that uh, I make this oval for me. It makes it easier for me to put much information in the van in the events in the event spaces. So this one is like life sciences. This one is physical sciences. This one is mathematics. Right. So yeah. So we have. Yeah, x minus five. Okay, we've already done this. X twenty nine minus x when I stand y is twenty nine minus x when I stand y it is thirteen minus x when I stand y it is x minus three. We understand y it is fifty minus x. We understand y it is thirty two plus x. We understand y. We already know that the Venn diagram is like this. If a student was selected at random, calculate the probability that he studies the following. One, only one of mathematics of physical sciences and life sciences, only one of those. What is the probability there? What is the probability over there? All right, so 
the probability. Right, the probability P only mass or um, physical sciences or L life sciences. Okay, life sciences you can say LS, okay, or just L in short. Right, so. Now, only math or physical sciences or life sciences. So, what is this? What is this? Right, so let's analyze the uh, in the Venn diagram. So, it's only math or, so in other words, it's only math, it's this one, or this one, or this one. So it means that it is going to become what? It's going to be like 13 minus 5. What is 13 minus 5? It's exactly 8. Or here you put 13 minus 3, which is equal to 10. So... plus 13, which is 45. So you have eight or 10 or 35, right? Very good. Which means that here you'd have eight or 10 or 45. All divided by 174. And this is exactly 21 divided by 58. And uh, if you use your calculator, this is approximately 0 0.36. If not just accurately that, but just use your computer there, or calculator to do the decimal. So yeah, um, check that uh, twenty one divided by fifty eight, and the answer is zero point three six approximately. Yeah. So now, if a student, what's the probability now? If a student was selected at random, calculate the probability that he studies the following. He does only math or physics or life sciences, so he's just gonna have the probability of zero point three six. Next question. That is the end of the Venn diagram question. Okay, let's look at more probabilities and also the idea of independent events and also mutually exclusive events. So let's speak about mutually exclusive first. And then we're gonna speak of complementary events. Mutually exclusive. What are mutually exclusive events? So mutually exclusive is when the probability of A and B is equal to zero. These events are mutually exclusive. These are mutually exclusive. When the probability of A and B equals zero, simultaneously we speak about independent, Independent, independent would be that the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B. So this will be independent. Independent means that one. And then we have complementary events. Complementary. Right, complementary events. Right, complementary. 
events. What are complementary events? Two events are complementary. Normally, we speak about the complement. So in other words, uh, the probability of a complement is one minus the probability of a. So these are said to be complementary. So yeah, so you can say the events are complementary if the probability of B is one minus the probability of A. So A and B are like complementary events. Okay, just mentioning some things. Let's do this question. I've made space available for this. Next page. Right, so if you look at the two events, A, B, and C are such. The events A, B, and C are such. A and B are independent, B and C are independent, and A and C are mutually exclusive. Their probabilities are the probability of A is 0, 0,3, that of B is 0, 0,4, that of C is 0, 0,2. Calculate the probability of the following events. Let's analyze these together. Okay, probability of yeah, the probability of the following events occurring, both A and B occur. What is the probability that both A and B occur? So we are looking at this question here. We are looking at this question here together. Right, both A and C okay. Remember that we have that A and B are independent, B and C are independent. A and C are mutually exclusive. So which means therefore, the probability, we need to calculate the probability. The probability of A and C. The probability of A and C is equal to zero. Why is the probability of A and C equal to zero? It is equal to zero. The reason for that is since A and C are mutually, mutually exclusive. A mutually exclusive There is no there is no intersection there is no intersection of a and c right so in other words uh, Calculate the probability. They wanted to know what the probability is. Is the probability of one or the probability? Remember, the probability always lies between what? The probability of anything. The probability of an event is either zero or one maximum. It lies between zero and one. Okay, so the probability of A and C occurring is zero. Because they said, cal calculate the probability. Why is it zero? Because A and C are mutually exclusive. So the probability is already zero. Why is it zero? Since A and C are mutually exclusive, there is no intersection of A and C. So in other words, if you look at A, event A, and event C, in, in a Venn diagram situation like this, they don't meet at all. They're like separate. Uh, because they're separate, they are mutually, they are mutually exclusive. They are mutually exclusive. They are mutually exclusive. All right. So that's what we have. That's what we have. Next question. Calculate the probability 
of the following events occurring, both B and C occur. Both B and C occur. Right, remember that the probability of, of B and C occurring Because B and C are independent, so we already know that it is a probability of B times the probability of C. And these are, the reason is uh, since, why do we write this formula like this? It is true since A and C, rather B and C, Since B and C are independent. So now we do the calculation here. The probability of B and C Then you have the probability of B, which is 0, 0,4, times the probability of C, which is 0, 0,2. Right, so you multiply this, which becomes uh, 0, 0,08. So the probability of B and C. Yeah, convert the probability of the following. Both the P and C occurring. This is the answer. This is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0,08. Why do we use this formula of probability of B and C equal to probability of B times that of C? Because we're told that B and C are independent events. Okay. Next question. Okay, we already know the story. But if you want to find the probability of the following events occurring, at least one of A or B occur. I said, I'm coming, we're coming back at 2 p.m. For those who are going to be free at 2, we're going to be doing more at 2 p.m. For those who want to join or for those who are free. But now I want us to look at 4.3. At least one of A or B occur. At least one of A or B occur. But you know that A and B are independent. Okay, if they say at least one of A or B okay, at least one, it means that either A or B okay. So we're going to find the probability of A or B. Right, so if they say at least one of A or B okay, we're going to find the probability of A or B. What is the probability of A or B? There's a formula, which is uh, the probability of A plus the probability of B minus uh, the probability of A and B. This is the formula for the probability of A or B, right? This is the formula. So now we're just gonna fill everything in here. What is the probability of A in here? Probability of A is, okay, but first things first, I'm gonna also mention because obviously in this question, they do not give us the probability of A and, A and B, but they give us the probability of A, the probability of B, the probability of C. But we can do this. The probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A times the probability of B. Why? Because A and B are independent. If A and B are independent, then wherever you have the probability of A and B, we can put times. We can put multiplication of the, of the probabilities there. Right. So the probability of A is 0, 0,3. The probability of B is uh, 0, 0,4. The probability of A and B is what? Okay, you already know that of A is 0, 
That is A0,3 put here. Because A and B are independent, so you can just change these two times. And then now the probability of B is 0, 0,4. Right, so you have this. You have, therefore, the probability of A or B. Uh, right, so what is the answer to this? So 0, 0,3 plus 0, 0,4 is actually 0, 0,7. 0, 0,3 times 0, 0,4 is 0, 0,12. Uh, right, so the probability of A or B, the probability of A or B is uh, the difference of the two, 0, 0,58. Zero comma five eight. Zero comma five eight. Zero comma five eight. So yeah, Let's calculate the probability of the following events occurring: at least one of A or B. Okay, so we have that, that answer. Right, we have answered this question on the probability and we are enjoying probability calculations. So we have looked at mutual exclusive events. We have looked at independent events. We have looked at complementary events. Right, we look at complementary events. Right, we look at complementary events. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just recapping on this so that you can have a, you can remember complementary events. Right, the probability of B is one minus the probability of A. Then A and B are complementary events. Okay, right. We we looked at these probability calculations. Let's look at something else now that comes in the exams as well. So, but yeah, this morning we are talking probability. Okay, it's not only probability that we need to know. There are like other things that you need to know um, besides probability. Okay, probability is one of the things, but um, what other things do we need to know about mathematics? Math is not all about probability anyway, but uh, what about other things? What are the other things that we need to know? The other things we need to learn and understand ourselves. These other things we need to learn and understand are the things that pertain probability calculations. Right. Okay, let's look at this question. Consider the word product. This word product. So this is just a question. Let's uh, answer the question about probability. Uh, obviously, it's not direct about probability, but it relates to probability. We need to know how many different arrangements are possible if all the letters are used. We want to form arrangements. So we are learning arrangements. So besides probability, we need to know arrangements. How many different arrangements? How many different arrangements can be made if the first letter is T and the fifth letter is C? How many different arrangements can be made if the letters R, O, D must follow each other in any order? Okay, let's understand and solve the problem. Right, consider the word product. Consider the word product again. How many different arrangements are possible if all the letters are used? First things first, you need to look at the fact that how many P's are there? There's only one P, there's only one R, there's only one O, there's only one D, there's only one U, there's only one C, there's only one T. Now that is then uh, very, very important. So want to calculate uh, the um, how many arrange uh, different arrangements are possible if all the letters are used? 
So we're going to look at the number. Number of arrangements. Um, right. Number of the arrangements. They want to know how many arrangements. So to calculate the number of the arrangements, we count the letters here. Right. First things first, we see how many. There are two, four, six, seven letters. So we're dealing with seven letters. Right. So dealing with seven letters, then we're going to make a choice of the first letter. The first letter, if we want to arrange them, we arrange them like this. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we have like seven slots, seven blanks we have organized for this. I'm trying to teach this a little bit so that you can like understand the basics of counting and how we do the arrangements in mathematics. Okay, there are a total of seven letters and then we ask ourselves the question, um, how many different arrangements are there? How many different arrangements are there? So we need to make arrangements. So if you want to make arrangements, we can choose, if you want to arrange them, you want to put them um, in a row. You want to put them in a row. So you choose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can choose any of them. But the first letter that you're going to place here, you can choose among the seven. So in other words, for the first letter, you have seven choices. You have seven choices. After the, the first letter has been put here, you can choose one of them. Maybe you chose D. Then you have uh, now a total of six letters remaining. And so now you must choose one um, out of the six and uh, put it here. So because there are six of them, you have six choices. Six choices to make. After that, this, this has been chosen. Then you have a total of uh, um, how many? You have a total of five letters remaining. Right. So if you have a total of the five letters remaining, then what do we do? Okay, we have five letters remaining. So in other words, uh, you have five choices. You can choose amongst five objects. So you have like five choices. Okay, I'm trying to teach you this a little bit so that some of you can understand the basics because yeah, you're at different levels of math. Um, but some are advanced among you, some are not advanced. So they are, but this might be new to some of you. The, the notion of arrangements, arrangements. So now you have, Okay, you have chosen um, three letters so far. Maybe you choose D, these out. Then you're left with one, two, three, four. So when I have four choices to make, you can choose among four. After you have chosen that, you can remove, maybe you choose R in any order. Then you can actually then choose among one, two, three. Then you have three choices. Three. Okay, after a three, maybe now you can choose P. P is out. Then you have P and O remaining. So those are two letters. So now you're going to have two choices. Two choices. After that, maybe you choose P, then you're left with only O. Then there's one choice. There's one choice. Right, there's one choice. So which means if they say how many different arrangements are possible if all letters are used. So you have six choices, seven choices times six choices times five choices times four choices times three choices times two choices times one choice. And therefore in mathematics, when you have seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, we say you have seven factorial. We say it is seven factorial. Like seven 
factorial. Okay, for some of you might have not seen this symbol like an exclamation mark in English. If somebody is shouting, you put this kind of a symbol in English, but in mathematics, it means a factorial and it means you are multiplying seven times six up to the number one. So in terms of the factorial, there are just some examples you can give. Like three factorial is three times two times one. Four factorial is four times three times two times one. Okay, we can do like five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. What is three factorial? Three factorial is three times two times one. What is three times two? It's six. Four factorial is four times three times two times one. Four times three is 12 times two is 24. So four factorial is 24. Five times four is uh, 20. By three is uh, 60. By two is uh, 120. So five factorial is 120. So seven factorial can also be computed. You can write uh, the number of arrangements as seven factorial. You can leave your answer like this. But you can also use your calculator to do the factorial and then get 50, 40, 5,040. In which case, therefore, 7 factorial is the same as 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Right, so what is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 540. This is 50, 40. It's 50, 40. Okay. So we have exactly that there. Right. So we continue and we look at more problems. We solve more mathematics. How many different arrangements can be made? If the first letter is T and the fifth letter is P. So, yeah, we're looking at the arrangements. So we're going to put some blanks, but we are, we need two, four, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven blanks. Uh, six, seven blanks. Right. So we continue. We have six, then seven blanks. So how many different arrangements can be made if the first letter is T and the fifth letter is C? Okay, look. We want to look at how many different arrangements can be made if the first letter is T. So here we're going to put T here. And then the fifth letter is C, okay? Fifth. Number five. You put a C here. So we are counting different arrangements, people. So now let's continue. We're looking at the different arrangements. Different arrangements here. The first letter and the fifth. So now it means that if we make the first letter T and the fifth letter C, uh, what do we have? What do we have? Okay, and let's count and uh, calculate the arrangements in mathematics. So in other words, we have we cut this one out. We cut T out because now, and we also cut C out. So we are left with two, four, five letters to arrange. Out of the seven, two are out. What is this five letters? So 
got a letter we can put here. We can choose amongst two, four, five. So we have five choices in the first slot. Five choices. After that one, maybe R is out, and then we have four choices. After this one is out, then we have three choices. Okay. All right, let me see now. <laughs> Maybe you cut this one out, uh, then you have uh, two choices. After that one is out, and then we have one choice. All right, so we continue. We continue. Then we have one choice. Right, so. 5.2, the number of the arrangements. The number of arrangements. It's gonna become what? Right, we continue. Okay, let me see. Okay, somebody said five factorial, well done. Thank you so much from Paul. <laughs> wow, that's awesome, Paul is right. It's already five factorial. So the number of arrangements in Paul is right, it's gonna be exactly five factorial because we just have this. So it's gonna be, as Paul was saying here, it's gonna be exactly that one. So it's gonna be five times four times three, times two times one. Thanks, Mpo. It is therefore called five factorial. And if you use your calculator, it's like 120. The number of the arrangements is 120 arrangements. Okay, so we are surely good. Let's look at 5.3 now. Okay, we still have the same word product, but now we are having like a set of different rules in this question. And they're asking us to do a couple of things. They're saying, right, you need to determine um, how many different arrangements can be made. If the letters R, O, and D must follow each other in any order. They must follow each other in any order. So obviously, let's look at this one here. So you have, uh, obviously, I have to arrange the seven letters. Let's look at this one. Uh, just a different uh, rules a little bit. They're trying to change, but the same thing. So position one, position two, okay, we have seven blanks for the seven letters. We need to place them on top of the blanks. So one, two, three, four, five, six, then we put the seventh letter. And then now we then say, um, how many different arrangements can be made if the letters as said R, O, and D must follow each other in any order? So if the letters now R, O, and D, they must follow each other in any order. What do we have? So we can have a couple of cases like where they follow each other. Right. In, the, in what ways can we arrange these letters such that they follow each other? So first, if these ones are to follow each other, we need to first organize these letters so that they follow each other. So, you know, in how many ways can you arrange these letters so that they follow each other in any order? So now they are one, two, three, right? Like that. So you'd have like one, two, three letters. You put them here. 
Right. So the three letters, you can start with any of them, you know, so that they follow each other. In how many ways can this be? So you can start and have like R O D, or you can have O R D, or you can, in other words, you can start with the R, you can start with the O, or you can start with the D, um, R O, or you can start with, um, for instance, even if you start with the um, with the R, you can start with R still and have D O. Right. So the R, you can start with R and have O D and also have D O. If you start with O, you can have R D, but you can also have D R. So I mean the order is different. You are arranging them. So here this second place, here this third place. So but obviously we can't always write all these because we are interested in time. So if you arrange the three letters now, these ones, they can be arranged in three factor ways. So if you look at the ROD, they can be arranged in the first letter you can put here. You need to choose either R, O, or D. So you have three choices to make. After that, maybe you choose D for uh, O for argument's sake, then you'll have two letters. You have two choices to make. After that, you have chosen, yeah, the second one, D. And then the last one, you have one choice to make. You have already arranged these letters here. And then now you need to con continue. And now, because how many different arrangements can be made if the letters must follow each other in any order? Any order. So you can start with the R, you can start with the O. So, yeah, but I was writing this. So normally we do this. We don't write all these possible uh, combinations. But, yeah, you can start with the O, R, D, and then it's the R. If you start with D, for example, it can be R, O, but you can start with D and have O, R. So at the end of the day, you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this six is the same as like three times two times one, the three times two times one, which is the same as three factorial, which is the same as six because three times two is six, okay? Now here we come now. So these ones now have been organized and they're like one block. Out of the, we like organize them, they're one block. And then we come to these ones. These ones, now we are left with a total of how many letters to organize here? Right, so here we're left with, we have a total of one, because it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So here we're left with a total of, out of the seven letters, two, four, six, seven, we are left with uh, four letters. After we have chose, removed the R, we have removed the O, we have removed the D. So we are left with P U C T, and these are four letters that we need to arrange here. So the first letter we can put here can be put here in four. So we have four choices. And then now here, after the first letter has been chosen, maybe P is out. Then we have uh, three choices for the next one. Okay, after put the third one, then you have two choices. After that, we have one choice. So now we have this question for three marks in how many different arrangements can be made if the letters must follow each other. These ones are like one thing. But now, so look at this one as one block. So this is one block or one letter. You can look at them as one thing. So we have, uh, in the end, this kind of an arrangement. 
We have this kind of an, of an arrangement where now you have uh, to draw like this. Which means it's one block letter, two, three, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Because these are like one thing, they must follow each other. So you can't mix them with the others first. But if they follow each other, they are like one letter. So which means that the number of the arrangements, the number of arrangements, Okay, the number of the arrangements now, we have a total of five letters to organize. Five letters to organize. Okay, it's a little bit tricky, five letters to organize. So you have five choices to make. Right, so you deal with five choices. And then after that, we have four choices. We have three choices. Four times three times two times one because we have yeah, two choices and then one choice. Which means it is five times, which is five factorial. And five factorial is 120. Uh, all right, I want to make a change here a little bit. Right, I want to make a small change to make it easier. So in, in effect, what we're saying here is you'll have to make the arrangements like this. And then say here is three factorial multiplied by, okay, three factorial for the ROD. And then now you'd have five factorial for one, two, three, four, five letters. So these six, three factorial is six, five factorial is 120. If you multiply everything, it becomes 720. So how many different arrangements can be made if the letters must follow each other in any order? It's a little bit tricky, but please just learn it. It's 720. Next question. Next question. Okay, we're looking at like more probabilities now. But one thing that you need to learn is the idea of a tree diagram. Okay, we looked at two-way tables. We looked at the um, mutual exclusive events. We looked at um, independent events. Uh, we looked at um, the Venn diagrams. But we are looking now at something we call a tree diagram. What is a tree diagram? We analyze a tree diagram together. Right, to do tree diagrams now, we're going to do them like this. We're going to do them like this. We're going to do them like this. Right, so the probability that it will rain on a given day is 63%. A child has a 12% chance of falling in dry weather. And, okay, let's uh, read this. So, yeah, we're going to do it on the next page. I've made enough space available for us to do the tree diagram, the probability um, that a child will not fall on any given day and the probability that a child would fall in dry weather. But obviously, let's just uh, maybe... Get a sense of this question about the tree diagram and what they want us to actually do here. 
what the examiner is asking because these are like from past exam questions. They are not questions that just decided to bring. These are past exam questions. The probability that it will rain on a given day is 63%. So the probability that there is rainfall on a given day is 63%. A child has a 12% chance of falling in dry weather and is three and is three times as likely to fall in wet weather. Okay, so in other words, children fall all the time because they are still small, but they are still learning how to walk. So the children, sometimes when they are walking, they fall down. So this question from the examiner was looking at the children falling when they're walking. But here is a child. A child has a 12% chance of falling in dry weather. So if the sun is out, the child has a 12% chance of falling. But if three times as likely to fall in wet weather, in wet weather is three times, it's likely to fall more three times when it's wet. Okay? Because the rain brings, makes the um makes the surfaces to be wet. Draw a, a tree diagram to represent all outcomes of the above information. Let's look at the tree diagram here together. Let's look at the tree diagram here together. We analyze this. Okay, I'm just doing this. I didn't to ask you about tree diagrams, the probability, you know, you understand probability more. That's what the discussion is about today. Right, so in 3.1, let's draw the tree diagram here. The probability that it will rain on a given day is 63%. A child has 12% chance of falling in dry weather and three times is likely to fall in wet weather, draw it three or three times. It's likely to fall in wet weather if it's wet and it's rainy. Right, because sometimes it rains, sometimes there's rainfall, sometimes there's no rainfall, sometimes the sun is out. Okay, let's start. We start by looking at the uh, fact that either there's rainfall or there's no rain at all. So we agree that either on a given day there's no rain or on a given day, basically we agree that there might be rain. Hey, let me put it here. So on a given day there might be rain on a given day, there might be no rain. No rain, okay? Fine, write that properly. No rain. So. Right, so let's continue. But what is the, now the probability that it will rain on a given day is 63%. So the probability of rain is 63%. So if the probability of rain is 63%, what's the probability of no rain? The probability of no rain is gonna be 100% minus 63%. 37%. So the probability of a child falling, the child might fall, the child might not fall. Either the child falls when they're walking or the, the child does not fall. So a child has a 12% chance of falling in dry weather. Right, 
So let's analyze this one here. So either the child falls, either the child will fall or the child does not fall. Okay, we're just learning the three diagrams here. Yeah? Right, so normally they ask, they have two situations, either it's ra it rains or it does not rain. Okay, let's look at this carefully. A child is a 12% chance of falling in dry weather. Okay, let's look at if there's no rain. If there's no rain, then it's dry. And uh, the chance of the child falling is 12%. And the, ch the chance of the child not falling. If if twelve percent is the child, the chance of falling. Not falling is going to be like one hundred percent minus twelve percent, and this is exactly eighty-eight percent. So it's like the complement of that falling and the not falling is like the complement of that. Okay, let's analyze this one. So, no, no rain and fall is the outcome. No rain and fall is the outcome. Here is no rain and not fall. No rain. And not fall, no rain and does not fall. Here the outcome is there is rain and the child falls. So rain and fall. Here is there is rain and the child does not fall. Okay. Oh, right, so we have this three diagram. What is the probability that now, um, When it's raining, the child falls. What is the probability? Yeah. A child has 12% chance of falling in dry weather three times. It's likely to fall in wet weather. So it is three times 12%, which is 36%. And therefore, It means that the child will have a 36%. A 36% chance of falling in when it's raining and therefore it's wet weather is 36%. But the chance of not falling is going to be like 64%, which is like the complement of that. Because so when you add these two, you must get 100. 30 plus 60 is 90. 6 plus 4 is 10. It's 100%. So these are complementary events. Falling, not falling are complementary events. Okay. So complementary events, if you add them, you get one, 100%. One or 100%. Okay, they said draw the tree diagram to represent, to represent all outcomes of the above information. This is it. This is the tree diagram. You need to draw it like this in the exam and you get six marks if you draw it like this. We're just learning three diagrams. If they don't ask you the two-way tables about the broken limbs we did, or they don't ask you about the Venn diagram, they can put a tree diagram there. Or they put none of these three. Okay, these are the tools. So yeah, we've learned the tree diagram. Next question.
what is the probability that a child will not fall on any given day? The child does not fall on any given day. Right, so let's look at this question. Right, well, remember, I'm just going to draw this quickly because we can only do this if you look at the, the diagram. So either it rains or there is uh, no rain. The rain is 63% chance. Um, no rain is 37% chance. And then this one here is 36% chance. And this one is 64% chance. Okay, 36% chance is a chance of falling or not, the child might not fall. Either the child falls or the child does not fall. Either the child does fall or does not fall. So, either, the, either the, there is rain and fall. Okay, we drew this here, but I want us to calculate the probability here. So, we need to see the tree diagram. So, um, the rain ends not fall. Yeah, either there is uh, no rainfall and the child does fall because the children, when they're walking, they can fall even if it's not raining. So, um, there's no rain and uh, the child does uh, not uh, fall, does not fall down when they're walking. So we have this. What is the probability that a child will not fall on any given day? 3.2. So let's calculate that one. The probability that the child does not fall. Okay, so now um, let's look at this one here. Remember, what is the probability that the child will not fall on any given day? So Obviously, on any given day, there are two possibilities. Either that day it's raining. So if it's raining, it is 63%. 63% is like 63 over 100 times. Okay. Remember, what is the probability of uh, that the child will not fall? If it's raining, for instance, if it's a rainy day, what is the chance uh, there of the child falling or of not falling? is 64%. So either it rains and the child does not fall. So raining is 63%, does not fall is 64%. Or you put a plus, either it rains or it does not rain. If it does not rain, what is the probability that it does not rain on a given day? It's 37%. 37 divided by 100. Right, so we also have a situation where um, the child does not fall, okay? It does not rain, but the child also doesn't fall. Right, obviously we did this one here. It was 12, 12% and 88% respectively. So it does not fall is like 88%, yeah? 88 to 100. The probability that the child does not fall. <laughs> okay, so if you calculate this one, the so 64 and the 63, you divide by 100, it gives 252 over 
65 plus now you look at the 60 uh, at the 37 and the 88 407 divided by 1250 the probability that the child does not fall So if you add this up, you get 911 divided by 1250. Use a calculator. The probability that the child does not fall. Right. Probability that the child doesn't fall. Not fall. Zero comma seven two eight eight. Zero comma seven two eight eight. Right, so we have this. Okay. So yeah, what is the probability that the child will not fall on any given day? The probability is 0, 0,7288. So yeah, just look at that and think about it. One more question on the probability. What is the probability that a child will fall in dry weather? The children fall even if there's no rain. So obviously, the children, they don't just fall if it's raining, but sometimes it's not raining and the children, boom, they fall down, okay? So let's analyze that together. Let's start, okay? The tree diagram already know, so allow me please to just sketch it quickly. And sketch it quickly like this, and sketch it quickly this way, and put some percentages here, like your 63%. Um, you can put 63% here, you can put 37%. You can do rain. You can do no rain. And then you can do 36%. 54%. And then you can do um, something else. So obviously it's either the child falls or um, does not fall. Either they fall or they do not fall at all. In which case then you have um, those here, it's 12%. Here it is exactly 88%. Right, so um, at this point, uh, what you're getting here is that you can have a situation where it rains. And indeed, the child does fall. So here you can have a situation where it rains and the child does not fall. In every situation where there is no rain and the child falls. Can have uh, no rain and uh, the child does not fall. Okay. So, yeah, okay, we have an idea of the tree diagram there. And uh, now let's find the probability in 3.3. Right, the probability that a child will fall, they will fall. So we look at the four, four cases, but the weather is dry. 
So now we are focusing on no rain, no rain, very dry weather. So which means that at this point, uh, we're gonna look at this here, the probability of dry. It's dry and the child does fall. Okay, if it's dry and the child does fall, um, right, so we're looking at no rain. So yeah, the probability of no rain is 37%. Where is 37? hundred. And the, the child falls down. Boom, fancy, falls down, 12%. 12%, boom, the child falls. Okay, 12%, you can just put 12 for 100, because the percent means, percent means divide 100. So y'all yeah, can just put 12 over 100. Right, I said this is recorded. So in case so your network is bad, please know that the video is gonna be posted. So if you multiply everything here is 111 divided by 2,500. And this is 0, 0, 0,0444. And this becomes the probability of dry weather. And fold up, falls down. Right, so yeah, about this. So, know that so we have this here let's see now okay i've kept it on air for all this time let me get the next question right the next question um, is about sequence and series i just brought a question on sequence and series so let's just try this one quickly and then i'm going to release you and then we're going to be back at 2 p.m for those who are free at 2 p.m but let's we shall take a break Quickly after this question. The sum of the first n terms of a geometric sequence, 9 plus 6 plus 4 is greater than 25. Um, calculate the smallest value of n. So obviously here we're looking for something because it is a geometric sequence. So we have something called a constant. Constant ratio. We call that R. Second term divided by the first term. Second term here is the number six. The first term is the number nine. The answer, it is therefore um, divided by three, two times, three times. So, which means uh, we have that, but obviously we're dealing with the sum of the first n terms. So we're dealing with the, the summation. Right, dealing with the summation, one minus r to the n divided by one minus r. So if n is if the, the first term is the number nine, the constant ratio is two thirds to the nth power divided by one minus two over three. And obviously this is greater than 25. Okay, so yeah, we need to solve for n out of this. And so we're just dealing with sequence series. I'm going to release you, please, after this question, so um, so that you can have a break and then and relax. In the enjoy yourselves a little bit more. Right. So if you manipulate everything here. I'm not going to waste a lot of your time there, but it becomes 2 over 3 to the power n less than 2 out of 27. That's what it becomes. All right, if we solve for n out of these, you take the log both sides. So it becomes the log of 2 over 3 the poor n 
and then the log of two out of 27. Which means n, the log of two out of three, the log of two out of 27. So now we need to solve, make n the subject of the equation. So we divide both sides. You have the log of two thirds, and then you have the log of two out of 27. You divide by the log of two thirds, divided by the log of two over three, the inequality is gonna change direction like this. Okay. Why does it change direction? Because we're dividing by a negative number. Because if you look at the log of two, two is smaller than three. So if you use a calculator and you, you're gonna do the log of two over three, it doesn't have a negative, but it doesn't look like it has a negative, but it is negative. Okay, because if you look at the log of that, that is the log to the base two. So um, if you do the log of that, it becomes exactly something. So you're dealing with the log, um, right, the log of two divided by three. Um, right, so you have approximately minus zero comma one seven six zero nine like this zero comma one seven six zero nine so it is indeed a negative number so in mathematics if we divide by a negative number the inequality if it's less than it must change to greater than so that we have that n is strictly bigger than, right? So if you use a calculator, you will get approximately six comma four one nine zero two four one nine zero two, which therefore means that we are looking for calculate the smallest value of n. So if n is strictly bigger than 6,4 n, this n is the number of terms. So the number of terms obviously is uh, a whole number. So which means that we have the smallest value of n, which is actually um, seven there. Okay, so that is the answer. The answer is seven terms. Okay, so we had to deal with the sum of the first n terms of the geometric uh, uh, series, this, is greater than 25, okay? So you know, they just use the word sequence, but I must indicate please that this one is a series because in mathematics, a series means a sum. A sequence would be nine, semicolon six, semicolon four, and so on. Okay, so just something for you to note, but I've taken this question from um, some material, but yeah, okay. So the person did not uh, type it correctly. It should have been uh, a geometric series because of summation. But yeah, we are done with this. Guys, so much thank you for joining us. The time now is actually exactly um, 12, 16 p.m. on Sunday. It's a beautiful Sunday and the date is what? The date is the 29th October 2023. Okay, and it's a sunny day outside and there's no rain outside. Okay, I must thank you for joining us. Please, I'm gonna we're gonna be back again at 2 p.m. for those who are free. If you're free, I'm gonna send this it's the same link so you can join and then we continue. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm going to pause the video in a couple of minutes. Enjoy your day so far. See you at 2 p.m. for those who are going to be free. Thank you and goodbye.
Goodbye, guys. <laughs> Goodbye.